we've got Bruce the Kale right here. He did a very good talk last night, last afternoon, about uh, distributing the web. And um, we had a good turnout there. It was really awesome talk, thank you. Um, right now, he's going to be talking about the Internet Archive, uh, which you probably know. He's the one that founded it, so he knows a lot about it, I think. <laughs> Let's hear it. Here's Brewster. A guy that's sleeping, snoring very loudly uh, right next to my tent, so I know that not everybody is, is, is awake yet. This has been completely, uh, uh, completely great. So I'm going to talk about basic... You can think of the Internet Archive as hacking the copyright system or trying to get institutions to do things that they're not used to doing. Um, or the way I like to look at it is let's go back to the Library of Alexandria and do it again. And let's go and do the Library of Alexandria that's available to everybody. Can we make all the books, music, video, web pages, software ever created by humans available to anybody that wanted to have access to it? Can we do this? And it turns out technologically, Actually, you can. The, between the storage of what we have on, on computers now and the internet in terms of getting it to people, you can do it. So you say, well, why hasn't it happened? And there's a lot of institutional issues um, of trying to get this to all happen um, that has taken a lot longer than I thought. But we're getting there. So what I'd like to suggest is that universal access to all knowledge is within our grasp, and we're getting there, but we need a lot more help uh, to be able to get there. So who are we? Uh, the Internet Archive is a nonprofit library. Um, is this showing? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a nonprofit library in San Francisco. Please visit us. Um, and uh, we've been around for almost 20 years. And the idea is to try to do the pieces of the internet that haven't gotten there yet. So as people are going and making things available on the net, they're mostly forgetting about the old things uh, and the like. We see ourselves in the tradition of libraries. I like looking at what people carve in stone. What they carved in stone above the library in Boston was free to all. And this was put there by the robber barons. These are the capitalists that were not nice men, right? They, these guys were all about property and mine, mine, mine. Yet they carved free to all above the library that was their legacy. And why? Because information serves a different purpose than just selling stuff uh, back and forth. So this is the tradition that we're in. Now, I'm an engineer, so I go out of any problem from an engineer's perspective. You go and say, okay, if we want all books, music, video, web pages up there, you have to say, well, how big is it? How hard a problem is it? Where do we get it from? How do we make it all work? So that's the structure of this talk. All right, so let's start with books. If we say, all right, we want to do all books. The biggest book library by far is the Library of Congress. And they say they've got 28 million books. So 28 million books is by far the largest library ever made in the world. A book is about a megabyte, if you have it in Microsoft Word. So 28 million megabytes, mega, giga, tera, 28 terabytes. At 28 terabytes, that's four hard drives that you can buy at a local store. So you can have all of the words in the Library of Congress in a shopping cart for less than you pay in a month's rent. Something has changed, something's happened we could actually think about having all of this history um, easily accessible. And then the question is, you know, would you want to, to do it? And the answer is yes, actually, we're getting we're pretty used to having books on screens, even scanned books. Scanned books, uh, so it's not on Kindles, but you know, images of pages, the screens are good enough, you get these beautiful books. But you can also take it another step. In some places, they say, well, we don't all have screens, we're not all online. Can you print it back out again? So we made a bookmobile. It's a print-on-demand bookmobile. So we put a satellite dish, a printer, cutter, binder, and kids make their own books. It costs about a euro a book to go and download, print, and bind a book. Cheap! 
So it's actually cheaper to do that than to lend it from a library. A study at Harvard said it cost $3 just administratively to lend a book. So for small books, you can actually do, um, you can make things available as long as people don't yell at you. Um, in India, we went and made a, a couple of them. Uh, this is the first day at the Library of Alexandria in Egypt. Engineer working with a kid, a uh, happy kid with his own book. And we did it even in Uganda. This is the first book this girl has ever owned. So, e so we could take not only our books and our music and video and make it available to us, but we could make it available even another step out there, uh, which is pretty cool. There are these Rube Goldberg machines. They're these oddball things that go and do it on demand, and they can make books, and they come out a shoot. But I think the real way that things are going, as we all know, is more on the area of screens. And the screens are getting so good um, that we can actually do beautiful books that are pleasure to read uh, and go and take our, our books and make them available in lots of different formats. My favorite on here is in the bottom right. It is a little talking machine for the blind and dyslexic. It talks a little bit like this. But they now have access to millions of books that they never had before. Okay, so now you're convinced maybe that it's a good thing to have it up there. We can go and have the storage to be able to have it up there. Then how do you get it done? Well, we've been doing these different things like uh, putting scanning centers up. This is at the Library of Alexandria. This is a guy, he doesn't look too happy. Well, anyway, uh, they've scanned about 170,000 Arabic books there, um, and it's been continuing along. Then we designed and built our own scanner uh, called the Scribe. We made these scanning centers. Uh, this is the one in San Francisco where they're doing microfilm down the center and gotten it so that it's fairly efficient to basically turn the pages. You say, well, shouldn't you use robots? And we've tried the robots. Um, they don't work very well. They tear the books, and they're expensive, and they don't work very well. Um, I think they could work well, but the investment uh, hasn't been made either by us or by anybody else. But So we've been doing it basically by hand and getting beautiful books done. This is uh, rare books uh, from Korea. This is uh, biology books out of uh, China by working with the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And we've now set up 33 scanning centers in eight countries where libraries are doing this. You say, well, Google has already done actually a lot more than we have, um, about 10 times more than we have, but they have a lot more money than we do, and they locked it up. And so they basically took even the public domain and made it property again. And this is wrong. I mean, if there's a sin in our world is locking up the public domain. The public domain is small enough as it is. Um, we should be arguing about maybe about what's in copyright. Um, so if they're the Microsoft, we're the Linux. Uh, and we're digitizing pretty fast. So I've been going around and asking different places, can we get everything ever written in a particular language? So I got to meet with folks in, in Greece, but they were kind of busy imploding. Um, there was uh, Iceland, and I, we got yes out of parliamentarians. We got yeses out of the head of the libraries. And there was one, per, out of 300,000 people in Iceland, there was somebody that decided they were in charge of the no department. So they said, no, and it all ground to a halt. But Bali said yes. So uh, we basically started working with Balinese to go and digitize everything ever written in Balinese. We want to just want to do it all, so let's go and see if we can get whole languages. It turns out the way the Balinese write is not on paper, but on palm leaves. They scratch it into palm leaves. Oh, it's completely cool. Um, and so these are these priests that worked with us to go and digitize these things by photographing them. They're just completely beautiful. And so now we've gone and digitized and photographed everything written in, in Balinese. Um, and, oh, when we ask them, how do you read your your palm leaves, they say, well, most people don't read. It's either the priests or there are these cool performances that are the, their culture. So shadow puppets or performances. And so we started videotaping these and starting to make them uh, go online. So I, I'd like to just give a round of applause for the Balinese to be the first culture to go completely online. I, 
Don't you think we should do this with Turkish or, uh, or, or Dutch or Danish materials? We can basically go and do this in such a way that their businesses still work uh, and still come up right. So scanning centers, we're doing about 1,000 books every day in these scanning centers all over the world. We've got about 3 million free e-books that are public domain, and we have modern books that are available to the blind and dyslexic, modern meaning probably in copyright, um, but we're also doing a lending system. Okay, here's hack number one um, on how to go and get things available to people, um, even though they're in copyright. So we've been, uh, we try to buy books from publishers so that we can lend them one person at a time. The publishers in general have said no so far. So we've been digitizing uh, books and we still lend them one person at a time. So where Google got into trouble uh, by getting into lawsuits and the like, we've gotten into no lawsuits. And so the way that this works is you can go to openlibrary.org, click on a book, say this uh, HTML5 for beginners, uh, which is actually a book that we bought, but you'd see that it's checked out by somebody. So then you have to put it on your wait list. But if you go for a, a less popular book, say like this History of Mayflower Descendants from the Boston Public Library. Surprise, nobody's checked it out. Okay, so you can go and say, okay, I want to borrow uh, this book. You have a choice of formats, and then you borrow this book. And another thing that's cool about this is it's borrowing it from the Boston Public Library. So these real libraries are digitizing books that are in copyright, non-rights cleared books digitizing them and lending them just like we are a library. And this has been going on for four years and it's been just fine. So it's a mechanism of trying to be respectful of those that are trying to make money off of this stuff, but still having access and having it happen. And we've been trying out this whole approach of how far can you go and working with publishers, but not working for them. Um, and basically building a library system and making it work. So uh, we've been able to get books um, by the hundreds of thousands that are my uh, current books and make them uh, of available. Okay, books. Let's go on to another media type, music. So what if we want, this is an area that has more lawyers um, than business people, it seems. I mean, just, this is an area that just people like to sue each other in the whole music area, so we've had to be a little bit more careful um, uh, about how we've gone about this. And we first started with rock and roll bands that wanted to be distributed. So it turns out the Grateful Dead started a tradition of allowing people to record their concerts and then trade them on cassettes uh, with other people as long as no one made any money. That's been a key thing that I've found in all of this is no one made any money. Um, and so we, as these moved online, the bands were up for being distributed online. So we asked some level of permission and it's usually the fans going and saying, is it okay to put your concerts on uh, the archive? And somebody has to say yes. Maybe it's the drummer, <laughs> you know, or somebody um, in that community says yes. This is a lot less than what lawyers uh, would like with, you know, signatures and all of that stuff. It's like, nah, is it okay? Yeah. And, and if it ever becomes not okay, then we take it back down again. But you know, that's only happened once. Out of, and we now have 6,000 bands up there and 130,000 concerts and everything the Grateful Dead's ever done. So the idea of getting music up there and out there uh, is, is starting to work as well. We're, there are these old collections that were on old websites um, before mp3.com was a format that was standardized. It was the bad old days of AIFF. Anybody remember AIFF? Yeah, bad news. Anyway, um, but there, there were these sites that were trying to go and do these and distribute music. One of them was the Inter Internet Underground Music Archive. And so um, they died a long time ago. Um, and so we're, we're now up, up, up. We have them up. We have got lots of net labels that are using us for free hosting. And we've been working along with uh, lots of different record producers now to start to go and do CD digitization. And there's a, uh, some, some engineers actually here in Amsterdam that have been doing uh, CD digitization software to try to help get all of this stuff to work well. And we're starting to get donations of LPs 
78 RPM records and the like, and starting to do mass digitization of these different formats. So why do this? Well, we, we haven't just gone and put everything up on the net. We'd like to maybe do 30 seconds and then point to Amazon.com or something like that. But so far, what we've done is made it available to researchers uh, and, and the like, and listening rooms, um, so that at least on campus, you can have full access to it. So we're starting to get better at music and getting better at the, uh, the whole areas uh, of music. So we've now added to our collections of other audio recordings that are freely hosted on the internet. So the idea of having infinite storage, infinite bandwidth forever for free for some communities is a very compelling offer. Um, so basically make things uh, available and put them up. So even audio is doable. Moving images. Most people think of movies as Hollywood films, and uh, we're not that good at collecting this stuff yet. So mostly we've been doing old films that haven't been particularly distributed like through Hollywood. Like those old films you saw in high school when they had a substitute teacher, they'd wheel in this projector and they'd show you why to be a typesetter or you know these old, are you ready for marriage? Um, anyway, these. So we've digitized these and made them available, and people love them. Uh, I'm not quite sure why, um, but they're there, and uh, we've been making these things available, and, uh, and people have been uploading things long before YouTube. YouTube really ran away with the whole area of video hosting. They own it, but there's still people, about a 1,000 a day, people putting things up in the Internet Archive because they want them maybe more permanent or, or some other uh, uh, reason. So we've been doing digitization, even VHS tapes, which all, almost all have rights problems. But we find if we do ones that aren't on DVD, nobody gets mad at us. So we're getting better at digitizing. Even television is doable. We started uh, archiving 20 channels of television in the year 2000. Russian, Chinese, Japanese, Iraqi, Al Jazeera, BBC, CNN, ABC. 24 hours a day, DVD quality. The idea is to at least hold on to it. Um, and so we've got 9-11 collections, but we're now starting to uh, lend television. So if you go to archive.org, you can basically go and search on what people said. If it's in U.S. television news, because it's the only thing that we've got the closed captions, that's the transcripts of what people said, and we, you can type in and go and say, I want to see things about Edward Snowden and find all of the clips that have Edward uh, Snowden in them, and you can then take those clips and put them in part of your blog, or put them, uh, or request a DVD of the whole program if you want to make a documentary. And this is working, uh, even though it's an enormous amount of materials. The, the publishers, that the networks, are happy about this. So we're actually able to make steps of making things uh, widely uh, available. We want everyone to be a John Stewart research department, like in the, the, the Comedy Central where they go and say, here's what a politician said before, and now here's what they said now, and doesn't it, you know, doesn't match. Um, that type of thing, to have people think critically about um, television. So even moving images um, is doable. So if you do this kind of thing that we're doing, to go and offer free hosting, sometimes you attract attention from people you don't like. Um, so the FBI gave us one of these nasty letters called a national security letter. A national security letter is when they demand information about our patrons of the Internet Archive, our users of the Internet Archive, and we can't even say to anybody that we've ever gotten this request. Um, so we got one of these things, and we got our lawyers, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Oh, hooray for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I said, what, what, can we do, what can we do about this? And they said, well, you have to comply. Well, can, we talk, can I talk to my board about it? No. Can I talk to anybody about it? No. Can I ever talk to anybody about it? No. If, what happens if I don't do it? Jail. Oh, is there anything we can do? No. Really? Well, you can sue the United States government. So we sued the United States government. <laughs> and won. So, 
So there have been hundreds of thousands of these letters, hundreds of thousands of these letters sent out. There have been only three organizations that have publicly gone and pushed back on the government, and they've been all libraries. What's great about being a library is you're allowed to go and say no. There's a long history of people being rounded up for what it is they've read and bad things happening to them, and people remember this. And so where Google doesn't have at least publicly hasn't said no. Um, libraries are sort of, our role makes it so that it's not an embarrassing thing to do. So we find that being a library is a good thing. Software. So there's a lot of software out there, and we're getting better at going and reproducing this software by running emulators in the browser. This was a real mind blow of taking C emulators of old Apple or Commodore or Atari uh, software and cross-compiling uh, it within Scripten into JavaScript, and it runs in your browser. So you click, and it actually boots an old IBM PC in your browser, and you're running your old game. It turns out this is very, very popular, because I guess a lot of people spend a lot of t or their early days playing games. Uh, but anyway, they're now back. Um, so Oregon Trail and all these other uh, games are very popular. What we're probably best known for is crawling the World Wide Web. So the, how many people have used the Wayback Machine? Yay! Um, so the Wayback Machine is a way you can see the web as it was. Um, that so many people are pouring their lives into the web, but web pages only on average last 100 days. So we go through and we try to archive them. And we started when it was pretty small, and it's now getting pretty freaking big. We archive about a billion pages every week um, to be able to create this Wayback Machine. Um, this is what Yahoo looked like in 1996. Um, Pets.com with the little sock uh, guy. Dorky old uh, web design. And I looked up what the... Um, I thought, oh, why don't I go and look at what Chaos Communications Camp looked like? So this is the uh, Chaos uh, website from 1997, um, but it actually looks a whole hell of a lot like the current one. So, um, uh, <clears throat> so I, there's, there's a little retro thing going on, so it's not quite as dramatic. Um, uh, there's another thing that this has been used for. A user came back and said, hey, Brewster, there's, <laughs> there's been a change um, that your web collection has the only place that can show it. This is a press release by the United States government of the president being on an aircraft carrier saying mission accomplished about a war in Iraq. And it says that the president announces combat operations in Iraq have ended. Then a couple days later, they changed it. And they put in major combat operations have changed. They didn't make any notice that they changed uh, a press release. It's George Orwell, right? To be able to go and redo press releases from the past, it's living in the day. So now this is, this is an example of why we want something like a Wayback Machine. Another is we have a web archiving tool that's a subscription-based service that a lot of companies and libraries and museums pay us to do, which is helpful. It keeps our lights on. Um, and we now have 1,700 curated collections, like the Japanese disaster, where people have come together to go and say, you should archive this because soon it's offline. Or archive these things, soon they're offline. So it's been a community project to be able to go and work together to build up what are the key things about an event to make sure that we really have it done well. So even web is doable. Um, so the World Wide Web collection of, of ours is probably about 10 petabytes of data. Um, it's growing at a few petabytes every year. We have about 450 billion web pages. Um, we get about 600,000 people a day using it. It's a database of 450 billion pages that gets queried about 2,000 times a second. And so that's sort of what the Wayback Machine uh, is. And it's been much more popular than we thought it would be, which has just been great. But even rare books and letters, you can go and do these things by photographing them and breaking them available. Next up for us is personal digital archives. How are we going to do this stuff that's splintered on all sorts of places? So people don't even have them. It's not like boxes in people's basements anymore. It's not even hard drives that you have. It's these Flickr sites and these other places that you've gone and put your memories and Guaranteed, these guys are going down. Uh, we, um, even the, the rich companies like Google, Google Video, 
Ever heard of Google Video? Well, it used to exist. There were six million videos on it, but they took it away. Uh, Yahoo Video is now gone. GeoCities is famously gone. Um, Apple Computer, the most valuable company in the whole world, couldn't figure out how to run 200 terabytes of mobile me on a continuous basis. So we archive that and making it uh, available. So don't count on these places. They, 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 they don't have your best interest in mind. Uh, they'll turn it off whenever they want to. So how do you go and preserve this stuff, both the physical and the digital? If we want to build the Library of Alexandria version 2, well, what's the lesson out of the Library of Alexandria version 1? What's it best known for? Burning, right? It's best known for not being here anymore. Um, so it, how do we go and make it so that we don't do that again? Well, let's have multiple copies. If we put multiple copies in multiple places that will have different fault modes, then I think we have a better shot at it. So we gave a copy back in 2002 to the new Library of Alexandria. And this is actually, they redid their first floor. If you get to Alexandria, go. It's a completely great um, a city and a, a, a library. And so there's, this is what it looked like in 2002. Uh, Access for All uh, gave us free space, and they have for the last 10 years. Thank you, Access for All. Um, uh, and so there's a partial copy. In, uh, in Amsterdam, um, this is what it looked like in 2008. Um, this is what the Wayback Machine, oh, we came up with this idea of doing uh, data centers in shipping containers. Sun ran with it, and they gave us one of these. So uh, the Wayback Machine was this. And so, oh, I get to ask, how, how big is the web? You have to ask me, how big is the web? The web is eight feet by eight feet by 20 feet. <laughs> so. For several years, when you used the Wayback Machine, you were actually using this shipping container that sat outside on Sun's campus, um, which is pretty great. Um, we've now made these prettier machines because we bought this cool church. Um, and so there are these blinking lights inside. Um, that is how, how we've been able to scale up. We've also started to scale up physical collections because libraries are throwing things away. So we've basically taken our, our ideas of how to do really compact and we've used shipping containers inside warehouses. So we have books or music or video that are in boxes, protected by a box, protected by a shipping container, protected by a warehouse, protected by nonprofits. So the idea is to try to have layers of protections against certain types of attacks. But we're not there yet, because, okay, we've got a copy in an earthquake zone, uh, the Middle East, and a flood zone. Uh, what could go wrong? Um, so I, I think we need some other copies in other places and more participation towards keeping our, uh, our whole society and cultural heritage safe. A couple other things that we're worried about the, at the Internet Archive is some of the uh, ways of trying to be sustainable in the, area, in the era of corporations. Corporations are basically becoming real strangleholds on certain types of things, like end user access. So we've been doing free public Wi-Fi uh, and the like. Um, so every time we get a building, we make, put free Wi-Fi with no passwords and stuff up, and that's, that causes people to get um, free Wi-Fi in some cases and mad in other cases, both of which are perfectly fine with us. Um, we've even gone and tried to apply open source ideas to housing. Housing has become a real problem because of the debt burden. So we're starting to try to transition housing to be able to support nonprofit workers that are debt free. If you're interested in this idea, we're, uh, we're really trying to figure out some of of these things. If you're going to go and build a new housing system for people that are working in the open source world, then you're going to need an organization like uh, a financial institutions. So we started a credit union um, and been trying to work with some Bitcoin companies. Oh, did that make regulators mad? Um, anyway, um, so th there's the idea of to take not just trying to make the data sustainable and copying it forward, but how do you go and get the communities around these materials to be able to have lifetimes that work? We're way into Bitcoin. People have been donating Bitcoin. If you've donated Bitcoin, and thank you very much. Uh, we pay our employees partially in Bitcoin, uh, and that's all, all around working. Project that needs help. There's a lot, everything needs help, but here's a few of my top. We're redesigning the Wayback Machine and could really use some help on, on trying to make this sort of new and different and neat. How do you do search 
at a level that we can actually do, because searching 450 billion pages is too much for us, but maybe site-based search and the like. Uh, we're trying to get Elasticsearch to be able to make um, all of our stuff more uh, accessible, the full text much easier to use. Um, and we're, we're trying to build software that can be distributed that people can archive their CDs, LPs, and books in a distributed way to go and participate in bringing these things online. There's a couple of programmers in Amsterdam looking for more programmers to help. And the distributed web is sort of a new idea that uh, if there's some mechanism to go and weave it together to go and make a next generation web that we don't have to archive by taking snapshots. We can actually archive working websites so that they'll live on for tens or hundreds of years after when the, uh, the original administrators are gone. So in conclusion, universal access to all knowledge, it's possible to do. I think it could be one of the greatest things humans have ever done. I think it could be the, one of the things that our generation gets to go and offer the world, kind of like the man on the moon or the Library of Alexandria in Asian's days, that we can pull this together. We have the technology to be able to pull it off. We've got the political will to live in an open environment as long as we don't lose it. And we have to act pretty fast, I'd say, because most kids have turned to screens instead of books or, or old materials to be able to find out information. They're learning from whatever it is they can get a hold of. And the best that we have to offer is not on the net yet. So we need to be bolder than we've been to go and make universal access to all knowledge happen. Thank you very much. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? <laughs> I'm sorry, no. No! Uh, I'm sorry. So I'm going to be hanging out. I'm at food, uh, the food hacking camp, and I'm just going to be hanging out here. But thank you very much for coming. Have a great day. Is this? Yeah, it's on now. I'm very sorry that we didn't have time. Okay, one more for Brewster. It was a very, very good talk.